Thank you very much for this nice introduction. Can I speak without this microphone? Do you all hear me very well? Very good. That's because I need my freedom a little bit too. <laughs> oh my. So thanks a lot for this for this introduction. I'm, I, I was told I'm speaking to a to a lay audience actually, and uh, when I when I heard the questions, I must say it's not a lay audience at all. You're pretty well informed, so it makes me very, very happy. And and you're very interactive, and you're very interested. It seems so. It's, and so that, that, first of all, makes me very happy to and very honored to speak to you today, especially getting a little bit more details about what Pat Sull Sullivan started to introduce. He took away a little bit of my most important slides. But anyway, uh, it's great that I can get a little bit more details about that because apparently there's interest in that. And, and I think this, this interest is definitely justified. It's one of the most thrilling projects in schizophrenia of the last years, if not decades. I'm pretty convinced of that. So there's one, there's one thing that makes our analyses pretty unique and pretty special. This is that we do not rely on knowledge, on biologic hypotheses that, that, that they are out there in, in the disease that we are actually studying. On the contrary, we are actually we are studying the whole genome without any genes that we want to find or whatever. And we, we want to find something very new in here. And I think you probably agree with me that, it's, that we all are desperate for something very new in there. And I think this first slide of Steve Hyman uh, director, director of the Stanley Center, but old uh, NIMH director as well, makes it very clear that pharmacologic treatment in psychiatry, most mechanisms of these are decades old. And most prominent example here in schizophrenia, the antipsychotic drugs, and David already made it clear here, the antipsychotic drugs, chlorpromazine, First of all, they were discovered more or less by chance. But second of all, this DRD2 receptor that you see here, this dopamine receptor, that this first drug that was, that was discovered, is actually the target of all pharmacologic treatments of schizophrenia to date, including clozapine. So since around four decades, there's not a single very new mechanisms out there. There are many beautiful ideas and, and many additions to the drugs currently in use, but there's not a, a full alternative yet. So desperate need of finding something new in here. So let's have a look at the history of these analyses that we are doing here. So you see the title of this plot, and that's why it's so great to present this here in this city, in this part of the city. This is what we call a Manhattan plot. What you see, so actually Pat Sullivan started to introduce this to you. So you see here on the x-axis the 22 chromosomes, so the, the actually the whole genome that you see on the x-axis. You see on the y-axis, this is like significance values. I don't want to bore you with too many technical details in here, but I want to tell you that there is a red line in here that you see here that we call genome-wide significance, and we want that our results that we are actually analyzing, our points in the genome actually pass this red line, and if they pass the red line, I will, I will paint them in bright red, and I will call them a skyscraper in Manhattan. You see here already, sample size is pretty large actually already, like there are 5,000 individuals under study. But what you see here very clearly, that this plot does not look like Manhattan. There's not a single skyscraper. There are a couple of smaller ones, so it's maybe Manhattan of well, of the last century or so, something like that, in the tens or so. And what happened then? The people, there were some very smart people who didn't give up when, while they were seeing this, this plot. You might also think like, okay, we, we, apparently it's not useful, this kind of analysis, but actually there are people who said it's very useful. 
Pat Sullivan, as she told you already, was one of the founders of this psychiatric genomics consortium. We have many, many people working together, bringing the data together, bringing the ideas together, their manpower. And we, we are also dealing, as you see it from the title, we are dealing with many different psychiatric diseases here. I will present to you our golden standard, our most successful analysis run here today, and this is schizophrenia in here. I put also two other pictures in here, not that I think they're more important than others in the consortium, actually everybody is important in this consortium, but these are from 2012, also award winners, winners here from BBRF, and I could have actually also put David Breff also up there since he's now a member of Schizophrenia Group as well, and Anita will present here this afternoon, she's part of the ADHD group. I just want to, I want to show you, this is, Consortium is definitely not an unknown suspect also to this community in here. Many people are here in here. What happened then? We all brought our to data together and we're working together. And then a couple of years later, 2011, this is how the Manhattan plot looked like. So you see already here, much higher sample size in here, 10,000 individuals with schizophrenia compared to 12,000 individuals without psychiatric disease. And you see here already five skyscrapers coming up. So it's probably Manhattan of the 30s. You see the Empire State Building coming up here. But we didn't stop here. And that's the important message in here. We didn't stop. We, we really continued collecting data and bring everybody on board. It was really an unbelievable time between 2011 and 2013, where really literally everybody came on board. We were presenting on these, uh, on these, uh, on these consortia, uh, on these meetings, psychiatric, uh, World Congress of Psychiatric Genetics is our, our most important meeting in here. And really, literally, so many people came on board and worked with us together. And this is what happened then. This is 2014, the data is actually out since 2013, and you see here what Pat already showed you this morning, you see here these many skyscrapers passing this red line in here. So here is the number of 97 genome-wide significant findings. There are different countings in here, it depends on if you include replication data set. But it's a bit unfortunate that you see the same slide twice in the same session of a meeting, but I can promise you this is one of the most important slides in psychiat psychiatric genetics ever, so I think it makes sense to see this twice or even more times. It's not only in every other uh, presentation of psychiatric genetics in the moment, it has been also printed on T-shirts and <laughs> Of course it has been printed uh, in an in, in important journal in here. It's actually Nature, Nature. I don't want to go into too much details in here, but I want to, to show you, I want to point you actually to, to one number in here that actually Pat started to present in here. So finally, after replication, et cetera, and so on, we got into 108 really distinct genomic locations that we can be very sure that they have something to do with schizophrenia. We don't know yet what exactly, but we know that they are. And now the journey begins to really get into more biology into this disease. I want to give you, this is these 108 regions actually span many more genes in there that are protein coding genes in here. Many of those, or let's say, I would say many of those, we don't have a clear answer about what their function is, but some of those, we actually do have a very clear answer of what they are doing and how they're implicated in schizophrenia, and that's what I want to present you today to show you that we are actually here dealing with something that's really real, that gives us more insights, or that will give us more insights in here. So first of all, there is this front runner that we are so happy in discovering. I told you before, we do not use any prior knowledge that we have in schizophrenia. Still, one of these 108 loci that I, that I just mentioned is the DRD2 receptor. So this is a plot 
so, so called region plots, very similar to a Manhattan plot, only that you zoom in very closely. This is a classic region of, this is one of these skyscrapers that you saw before. It's just spread out a little bit. And what you see in here are the different genes in here. And what, what is very clear here, you, you probably cannot read this here, but the gene that is directly affected by this association that we're showing in here is the DRD2 receptor. So coming back to the first slide that I did show you, without even having the knowledge, we could find now the top number one pharmacologic treatment that we have to date. But it's not only this one. Of course, we have many others. And I want to present you a couple of these ideas, but I want to give you the, the, my opinion that I'm convinced that amongst the 107 others we have, there will be one or two or three new pharmacologic methods out there that we still have to discover. They are, they are not, they're not here yet because the study is just a couple of months old. A couple of other examples that actually nicely support older hypotheses that are out there in schizophrenia. First of all, we heard from David, glutamatergic hypothesis is out there since many years. We, on the genetic side, can support this with association of at least three to four genes that are implicated into this hypothesis. Another, another um, hypothesis or another knowledge that has been out there since many, many years, Pat Sullivan started to, 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 to present you something about this. The CACNA1C is a gene that, for those of you who follow genetics of schizophrenia, know that, that this is a starting gene since, since a couple of years we know about this calcium channel in here. But interestingly enough, we see other calcium channels. There are probably like 15 calcium channels out there in the genome. We see other calcium channels coming up in this analysis as well, completely independent on different genomic locations, giving us the idea this is probably not a pathway, but it's, this is probably a genetic receptor group or channel group that we actually can start working with, and it's actually being done. The Stanley Center is actively working on, this, on these calcium channels and maybe on some receptor antagonists, agonists to treat schizophrenia. We heard already the word about pathway analyses, and there are many, many different ways out here uh, that deal with these pathway analyses. I want to give you a short glimpse about, it's a very personal set of slides. This is definitely not meant as, as being complete picture of pathway analysis. There's just one method out there that is very beautiful. Tuna Pears at the Broad Institute developed this method. First of all, this list is, you don't have to read this list, of course. It just gives you a, a, sh a short confirmation that these, these, these stories that I was just telling you, I was cherry picking good stories, calcium channel, DRD2, et cetera. On the whole level, if you, if you use all this information together, you get also some nice answers and confirmation. First of all, you get the confirmation that schizophrenia is a brain disease, which is probably not very surprising to many of us. But it also nicely supports another idea, and this is, if you look into this, these analysis, he can just, he can anal analyze not only pathways, he can also analyze tissues, and that's what I meant with brain disease, tissues that are actually associated to schizophrenia. And you see here this, this, this very nice, significant association between brain tissue and schizophrenia. That's what I just meant. But there's one other thing in here, and that's the most brilliant part in here. There's another tissue lightening up significantly to be associated with schizophrenia. This needs to be confirmed, but it has been confirmed a little bit already with other types of analyses. We have still to work on that. But this other tissue is immune system. And you will hear about this this afternoon, I, I, I assume, having seen the, the, pro, the program already, that, there, that this is also not an old, uh, a, this is a known suspect actually out there, immune system and schizophrenia. But it's very interesting that from the genetic side, we can, can confirm this. So what happened 
summarizing the history of this analysis method, the genome-wide association studies in schizophrenia that we have in here. Summarizing, you see on the x-axis the years that are passing by, 2006 to 2014. You see the different freezes or the different, the different steps where, where we analyze the data together. And you see here, starting from 2011, where we saw the first couple of hits in here on the y-axis, you see the number of discoveries of the number of genomic regions that we could find. You see 2011, this whole thing really starting off, really exploding, giving us more and more hits in here. So this beautiful development starting in 2011, so this plot here is a little bit misleading. This plot seems to suggest that you just have to wait. Obviously, that's not happening. It's not, these, this kind of data is not just sitting there like a nice, good wine, and just after a while, it's just a beautiful wine in there. No, of course, this is work to be done. And the number one work, and that's what we know nowadays, in genome-wide association studies, the number one developer bringing us to new success is not time. It's not great analysts, so, though they are very important, no question about it. The number one is sample size. The number one thing, and that's what you maybe have seen on the previous slide, is that we have so many patients and so many controls contributing their genetic information to us. And this is the same plot, the same number of discoveries. Just concentrate on the yellow line for schizophrenia. But here you have on the x-axis not the time, but you have the number of cases, the number of individuals with schizophrenia. It's very clear with this yellow line, after we are past like 15,000 cases, 15,000 individuals with schizophrenia and similar number of controls in there, that suddenly this explosion happened in here. What you can see in this plot as well, and that's a very interesting part of that, that we are since then, since 15,000 cases, we are on a very straight line. For every 1,000 cases that we include in our analysis, we get four hits more. And what you can see, this has been steady since quite a while, but you can also see that this line is not slowing down right now. Meaning, if we increase more, and that's what Pat actually uh, what Pat suggested or I already introduced that we are doing this currently, in, 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 that we are increasing more, we will find more regions to be implicated in schizophrenia. I cannot tell you right now when does it stop. It will definitely stop one day. That is for sure. The genome is, is finite. But it's not stopping right now. And I have already a glimpse, so Pat Sullivan already introduced you the psych chip that I will not go into too much detail, but we are currently genotyping 100,000 samples. Most, it's actually schizophrenia is this time playing a minor part in there, but still a big part. So it's not the, the biggest compared to the other disease, but it's still a very big part. And I had already the privilege to have access to most of this data, so we are halfway through with the project, and I can tell you I, I'm not allowed to show you, but I can tell you that we are clearly on this path way up here and that we are still on the same line, another four hits for each thousand cases that we add in, in here. So expect more to come, and we are clearly only at the beginning of the journey, but I'm very confident that we pushed open the door to really significant findings in the last two years in here. Of course, this is work that could have been done only with a collaboration. And this is the number one take-home message in here. Collaboration is the key for these kind of analyses. Nobody, not a single group, not a single university can collect that many individuals with schizophrenia or with any other psychiatric disease. No university has enough money to genotype all these individuals, et cetera, and so on. So this needs to be funded very well, but in also many, many different centers. And it's such a pleasure to work in such a community with so many thrilling people, and it's such a pleasure to present this to you. I'm deeply thankful 
first of all, to the patients and controls who do donated that genotypic information that we could work with this, but second of all, also to you that you paid attention so nicely. Thank you very much. Thank you.